I've been working my way through the last week, the Passion Week of our Lord. We have worked our way up through Tuesday, and Wednesday was a quiet day in Bethany. Uh, Tuesday was a full day of teaching, uh, starting when Jesus had his last uh, challenge in the temple, the different parables that he had given, followed by uh, the questions that were asked by the religious leaders, and then the lament over Jerusalem, followed then by the Olivet Discourse. And I just completed the Olivet Discourse on the last uh, video. And now we come to Thursday. We first of all have the preparation for the Passover, followed by the Paschal meal that the Lord had with his disciples. And at that point, during that, he washed the disciples' feet to teach them about humility and servitude to one another. Judas is signaled as the traitor, and the apostles themselves are warned against desertion. All of this precedes what is the great, uh, what we might call the upper room discourse, the great discourse. And uh, I remember when I was at uh, Dallas Seminary studying under Dr. Pentecost, one of my favorite courses was the life of Christ that, that he taught. And I remember we went through the harmony of the Gospels and application was made with interpretation around Jesus Christ. So I would like to go through a little bit of that uh, background on Thursday and then focus on the Upper Room Discourse. What a wonderful discourse. We saw the Olivet Discourse and now we want to look at the Upper Room Discourse. First of all, there is the preparation for the Paschal meal possibly uh, at the home of a friend, either John Mark's father or mother is one idea. We're not exactly sure, but it happened on Thursday afternoon. And Jesus tells the disciples to begin to make ready for the Passover in Matthew 26. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will we make ready for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city to such a man and say unto him, the master says, my time is at hand. I keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples were told in Matthew 26, did as the Lord had appointed and they made preparation for the Passover. Following this, Jesus then uh, partakes of the Paschal meal with the 12 apostles and also rebukes them for their jealousy. They were trying to decide who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus then, and this is especially uh, in the Gospel of Luke 22, beginning at verse 14 and following. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the apostles with him. And he said unto them, with great desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And there arose a contention among them as to which of them would be accounted the greatest. And it's interesting, one of the biggest things that we wrestle with in all through time, even in the ministry of the Lord, is who is the greatest? Who's the greatest preacher, the greatest teacher, the greatest minister? And I think how sad that is <laughs> that Jesus has to now rebuke <laughs> the apostles for contending in that way with each other. Now we're seeing this especially today on social media 
uh, people will say, well, look how many hits I got, or look how many people liked my videos and so forth. And you know, none of that should be about what our, our, our ministry should be about. It should be about being faithful, whether we get any likes or hits or anything really, it's about being faithful to the Lord. And we live in a day and time of selfies. In other words, everything is about what I've accomplished and my greatness. <laughs> and, and I read this and I think, my, the Lord is going to have a word for even us today like he did with the apostles. Notice he says in Luke, the kings of the Gentiles have lordship over them and they have authority over uh, them who are called benefactors. But you shall not be this way. He that is chief shall be one who serves. In other words, the greater among you, Jesus said, let him be as the younger and one who is a chief, let him serve. For who is greater, he who sets at meal or he who serves? Is it not the one who sets at meal to eat? But I am in the midst of you as one who serves. But you are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a kingdom, even as my father appointed unto me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and so forth. The point is, Jesus is encouraging servitude. It's important that we be servants rather than lords. And so it doesn't really matter how much applause anyone is getting. What really matters is to be a faithful minister, a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. I'm reminded then of what probably happened next before our Lord's crucifixion. And on Thursday, we have the washing of the disciples' feet. And this is found in John chapter 13, 1 to 20. And I believe the Lord is responding to their desire to be great in the kingdom of God. And he said, what you want to do is be a servant. And he gives the example. We're told now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, and I'm reading from John 13, beginning at verse one, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved them to the end and supper, being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, uh, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God. Notice Jesus already knew what was going to happen, showing that he is divine. And this is clearly taught by John. He rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? <laughs> Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. I get amused at Peter here. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. In other words, if you're really going to be a servant, you have to be what I'm about, I believe Jesus is saying. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, <laughs> And I get amused at this, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head, wash everything. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Jesus is saying, Peter, you've already had the bath of regeneration, of salvation, but not all of you are clean, referring no doubt to Judas. However, I believe what Jesus is saying 
I want to teach you how to be a servant. For he knew who would betray him, going back to Judas again, when he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken uh, his garments and sat down, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. In other words, I'm giving you an example of how to be a servant. Take the role of a servant, not the role of a master. And Jesus, who is Lord of all, the Lord of creation, is taking that role. What a challenge to us uh, in ministry to follow the Lord and taking the example of being a servant, not how great we can be, but how great we can serve others. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater uh, than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. In other words, if I'm a servant, you need to be. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture might be fulfilled, he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Here's a quote that Jesus makes from Psalm 41, verse 9, speaking again of Judas. Now I tell you before it comes, that when it comes to pass, you may believe that I am he, that I'm equal with God, when the resurrection occurs, that the Father and I are co-equal, that you disciples can assuredly believe that. John is driving that point home again and again in the Gospel of John. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Uh, Jesus continues the theme that we saw in Matthew 25, as much have you done it as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And so uh, Jesus said, I'm going to send you out, and he who receives your message is receiving me and also receiving the Father who has sent me. So Jesus begins this uh, meal by showing and teaching the disciples about servanthood what it means to be a servant. This is then followed by the meal where Jesus points out that Judas is the betrayer. In John 13, as we continue, when Jesus had said this, he was troubled in spirit and testified saying, I'm reading at verse 21 of John 13, verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. The disciples looked at one another, doubting as to whom it might be. And there was at the table, reclining at Jesus' bosom, one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter beckoned to him, and no doubt we're talking about John, and this is in John 13, 23, the apostle. Uh, tell us, <coughs> who is it that whom you are speaking? He, leaning back as he was on Jesus' breast, said unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus therefore answered, It is he for whom I shall dip the sop and give it to him. So when he had dipped the sop and he had taken it, he gave it to Judas, the son of Iscariot. And after the sop, Satan then entered into Judas, we're told, in verse 27 of John 13. And Jesus said, whatever you do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto, unto them. For some thought perhaps Judas had a bag and that he being like the treasure would go out and buy something for the feast that he should give to the poor. However, having received the sop, he went out 
And we're told in John's gospel that it was night. That is, he went out and it was night when he went out. After his departure, there is the disciples saying, you know, uh, we're going to be faithful. This is in 13, 31 to 38 of John. When therefore he had gone out, Jesus says, now is the Son of Man glorified. By the way, what an amazing text here. Jesus says, now is the Son of Man glorified. And this is the beginning of his passion. And I'm reminded of Isaiah chapter 52 at the end of that chapter. And I take that chapter to refer to Christ. Uh, we have the, the servant referring to Jesus, I believe, is to be lifted up and glorified. The Hebrew has three verbs, Yarum v'nisav v'gabama od. He shall be raised, he shall be lifted up, he shall be exceedingly high, where the Septuagint has uh, two verbs. He shall be lifted up, hupso thesitai, and he shall be doxas thesitai, he shall be glorified from doxazo. And I think John's referring back to that reference. Now the passion is beginning and glorification is beginning. Can we say the passion is the route to glory? And Jesus goes on to say, not only will the son be glorified, but God will be glorified in him. And uh, furthermore, straightway, he shall glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And as I have said, where I go, you cannot come. So now I say unto you a new commandment. And Jesus then begins to emphasize the need to love one another. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. This is in John 13, 31 to 38. And by this, shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have loved one for another. One of the most important things that Jesus keeps stressing in this upper room time with the apostles is the need to love one another and how we need that today. And uh, in this troubling time, we need to show that love for all fellow believers. Simon said unto him, Lord, where do you go? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterwards. No doubt speaking of the way Peter also would die. Peter says unto him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus said, will you really lay down your life for me? Verily I say to you, before the cock shall crow, you will have denied me three times. This is in John 13 verse 38. And so as we look at this, we're going to uh, now begin to see how Jesus introduced the breaking of the bread and wine, which was going on at the Last Supper. And uh, I want to uh, just uh, say a word about that, which is so important. This is in Luke 22, 17 to 20. We're told during the supper, he received the cup. This is basically at the last uh, Pesach that Jesus is celebrating. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink from this until I drink it new in the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus now is going to introduce a way of remembering him. And as we move on, I'm going back to Luke now, uh, 22. We're told he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, that which is being poured out for you. And so it was at this last supper 
that Jesus introduces the fulfillment of the new covenant. When we look at Matthew's account, it reads, he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, uh, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. This goes back to uh, Jeremiah 31. There's three great covenants. I call them Matterhorn covenants of the Hebrew Bible, the Abrahamic, the Davidic, and the new. In Jeremiah 31, uh, Jeremiah promised that the Lord would take away their sins in a new covenant. And Jesus, I believe, is speaking of himself as the fulfillment of that new covenant. And so at the Last Supper, he broke the bread and said, take, this is my body, which is on behalf of you. And then the cup represents the new covenant that Jesus Christ, through the shedding of his blood on the cross, would provide a fulfillment of Jeremiah chapter 31. So all of this is going on on Thursday. And what I would like to do is uh, go now or, or take a break from this video and then start another one where we go in to the upper room discourse and more uh, beginning in 14, 15, and 16, looking at what Jesus taught. And that would be on that Thursday night, what he was teaching them. And give thought to this great discourse followed by his intercessory prayer in John 17.